on Thursday. All right, so last week we talked about the very basics of the brain, and we talked, what are the four main parts of the brain? I'm just going to sit here and wait till someone starts say, yelling them out. The what? Lobes. The well, lobes are found where? I'm getting a headache. In the cerebrum. cerebrum. Okay. Why did this shut off? Try this again. Every single day this happens. Really annoying.
specimen. Okay, so the pia matter is the innermost, the arachnoid lies external, and you have <clears throat> what's called the subarachnoid space. All right, that space underneath the arachnoid, subarachnoid space, is where the cerebral spinal fluid is found. Okay? So if I was to take a, need a um, sample of cere cerebral spinal fluid, you have to stick a needle in through the, the dura matter, past the arachnoid matter, into the subarachnoid space to get the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay? And your dura matter is the tough outer membrane. There are two layers to the dura matter. I said one is actually attached to the muscle, that's the, uh, the bone overlying it. That's the periosteal layer. And the meningeal layer is the deeper layer. All right, so your periosteal layer of the meninges actually forms the periosteum of the inside of the cranial bones. Okay? So these three layers or meninges, all right, are important, okay, in, in for protection. When have you heard about meninges before? You probably all had a, a nice little vaccination that you have to have. Meningitis, okay? You have to have a viral meningitis shot. Okay, or bacterial meningitis, I don't know, there's two different ones. Okay, one's viral, one's bacterial. Meningitis is inflammation of these, a viral or bacterial infection that causes inflammation of these layers. And you can understand why it can be pretty serious, right? Inflammation means more cerebral spinal fluid, means more pressure, causes, can cause serious damage, especially to the brain, okay? The epidural space. Epi means above or on the perimeter. Dural refers to the dura matter. Okay? So the epidural space <coughs> is the potential space, the little space between the dura and the skull. Right? And this is where you end up with um, <coughs> arteries and veins. So in some cases, blunt force trauma to the head can cause what's called a subdural hematoma. Where is that going to be? What is it and where is it going to be? Below what? The dura, the dura matter. All right, so it's below the dura matter. What's a hematoma? It's like a blood. It's bleeding. It's a bruise. A subdural hematoma is a broken blood vessel underneath the dura matter. Why is that problematic? Puts pressure, puts pressure on the brain, right? Blood is flowing out of the vessels, right? In an open vessel, causes it fills space and puts pressure on the brain, which can cause damage. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Okay, here's uh, we'll go like this right here. From the top, from from the outside in, we have the skin of the scalp. The periosteum, the outer layer, here's the cranial bones. The inner layer of the periosteum right there is the periosteal layer of the, of the dura matter. I'll move over. There we go. Okay? And then the meningeal layer is underneath that. You can see here this little, so this layer is the meningeal layer. Separates, and it actually forms this kind of, there's openings all right, that are present in the meningeal layer and then forms this little opening that was called right there, what we call the falx celebre. Okay, that little opening comes down. This is a dural sinus. Okay, a dural venous sinus. Okay, this is important because. Underneath this web-like thing right here, see this web structure? That's the subarachnoid space. And what flows through the subarachnoid space? Cerebral spinal fluid. So cerebral sp spinal fluid comes up through here and goes through this little thing, this arachnoid villus, 
Okay? And it actually empties into this dural vein, venous uh, sinus. So this is where venous blood is and actually pulls that cerebral spinal fluid back into the circulation. All right, it helps remove some of the waste that's present there. All right, so they get transfer of waste and stuff out of that. Okay? Then, so you have the subarachnoid space, and then what you see in purple, a very thin layer purple around, uh, that's the pia matter that's present. Okay? Questions on the meninges. So is your epidural hematoma versus a subdural hematoma. All right? Epidural outside of the dura, subdural in the subdural space. All right? <clears throat> The, ep the subdural hematoma occurs more slowly, right? The epidural can lead to severe neurological, they both can lead, lead to severe neurological injury or death, but the epidural is a little more um, rapid, okay? And then we talked about meningitis, right? Caused by vac bacterial or viral infections. Fever, headache, vomiting, stiff neck, pain from the meninges sometimes refers to the posterior neck. I have a neck ache myself today. All right, um, just kidding. Yeah. The vaccine for most common bacterial strains causes meningi meningitis. You are, I think now you are required to have that to actually be on college campuses. Most, I know it's true for Quinnipiac. I think it's actually true for most college campuses now, okay? So the dural septa, the falx cerebra, is the largest of the dural septa. <clears throat> All right, and we'll see kind of what that looks like in a second. Uh, runs vertically, let's see it, and we'll see the picture. Okay, so here's a uh, sagittal view showing you kind of what the falx cerebra is. Think about as this dura is that packaging I talked about, and it holds the brain into a complete space, okay? So what do we know, what happens, what separates left and right hemispheres of the brain? What's that called? That separation is called what? Close. Longitudinal what? Fissure. Okay, so it's a separation. So we don't want anything moving, right? Any space in there. So think about this falx celebre actually goes in and follows that longitudinal fissure and holds the hemispheres in place. All right, so that's what you're seeing here. This is an extension. This would be the area where the left, uh, the left hemisphere is, and then in that white space, you would see the, uh, the inside of the right hemisphere, okay? So think about it, it kind of dips into and holds everything. And we have this other one. So we have the felt celebre, which is a longitudinal fissure. And then there's a separation between the ox occipital fissure, right, between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. This is where the tentorium cerebrae fits in, okay, and holds the cerebellum separate from the cerebrum. So it's very intense, uh, specialized packaging that holds the parts of the brain present and tight to one another, right? Questions on the, men, the, meninge, the meninges, meningitis, different parts. Yes, no, maybe. Good? All right. So <clears throat> we also talked about how, uh, last week, how the structures of the, how the brain develops through a tube. And so that, then that tube kind of uh, bulges out and then starts to fold. But that means that if I have... If you imagine this kind of like a balloon animal, right? A long balloon, that's the tube, and it starts to kind of fold out in different areas and it still ends up being hollow on the inside, right? Right? That's what's happening in the brain, okay? The brain, the hemispheres of the cerebrum are, so, are still hollow. They have an interior space, which they call ventricles, okay? They are cavities within the brain that are lined with ependymal cells. Ependymal cells are a type of neuroglia <coughs> that produce cerebral spinal fluid and help to 
uh, circulate cerebral spinal fluid. Okay? And eventually, you have ventricles in the, we have a ventricle in the right hemisphere and one in the left hemisphere. Those are the first two. They are connected by one in the middle, which is called the third ventricle, which is where most of the diencephalon is. And then another, the tube extends down to the fourth ventricle, which is between the cerebellum and the brainstem. And we're going to go through each of those in a little bit. Okay? So two lateral, a third, and then the fourth. All right? The fourth is connected to the third, what we we'll call the cerebral aqueduct. All right? And eventually, this all extends down into the central canal of the spinal cord. Okay? The meninges don't just cover the brain, they also cover the spinal cord. The same three that you find in the brain are continuous. All right? The dura matter changes a little bit, but uh, it changes a lot, but it is still present in the spinal cord as well. Okay? So this is what the ventricles look like from the side. I like this picture here on the right. You can see uh, <coughs> right and left ventricles, and they connect here in the middle, all right, into the third ventricle, okay, third ventricle, and then further down to the fourth ventricle. And you can see the, how extensive it is. It actually extends all the way back to each part of the lobes, the third ventricle in the middle, and then the aqueduct that goes down to the fourth ventricle, and then down into the central canal. There are openings along this, right, what we call apertures, right? For your camera, right, you, if you control the aperture on a camera, it's how open the lens is and how much light comes in, right? So an aperture is an opening, okay? So the lateral and the median aperture are small openings, and what do you think comes out of there? Spinal fluid. Okay, so cerebral spinal fluid will be produced in each of the lateral ventricles and in the, the, the uh, third ventricle by ependymal cells in what, what we call the choroid plexus. Each ventricle has a choroid plexus, a collection of ependymal cells that produce cerebral spinal fluid. It will then flow from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle, down the, so we'll go right, through here, to the third, down through the cerebral aqueduct, some will come out there, some will come out there, the rest will come down there, right? When it comes out, it actually flows back around through those vena, those dural sinuses, the subarachnoid space. We'll go through the flow of cerebral spinal fluid in a little bit, but just kind of give you a, Preview. Okay, cerebral spinal fluid is clear, colors look liquid that co surrounds the central nervous system. It circulates in ventricles and the subarachnoid space. All right, it provides buoyancy. What's buoyancy mean? <coughs> what is it? The ability to float. So what's floating? In this case, what's floating? The brain. The brain is floating, okay? Okay? And it thereby, because it's floating and kind of surrounds the brain, it protects the central nervous system in a liquid cushion, right? And the point of the cerebral spinal fluid, it keeps the central nervous system environment stable. This is how you remove waste and byproducts away from the neurons and such that are present, right? It transports nutrients and waste and protects against chemical fluctuations. I already said that it was formed by the choroid plexus of, and the ependymal cells that produce that, right? And there's some blood capillaries that are also present. Um, cere cerebral spinal fluid is basically made from blood plasma, okay? It's the liquid that red blood cells float in. So the plasma is filtered through the capillary, modified by the ependymal cells, and 
then becomes cerebral spinal fluid. Mm. So it has more sodium ions, chlorine ions, and less potassium ions and calcium ions. Why do you think it has more sodium ions and chlorine ions? What are these important for? What's that? Action potentials, right? Action potentials and calcium for the, re, the re release of neurotransmitters, all right? So it's blood plasma is not really the ideal fluid to, for electrical impulses to be propagated. So the ependymal cells, they adjust, okay? They, ch they change it a little, they modify it so it is ideal for electrical impulses, for neural imp impulses to be propagated, okay? <clears throat> so this is what the choroid plexus looks like. This is inside the ventricles. You see this little uh, collection of blood vessels and ependymal cells in this cavity, and that's where the, the transfer of materials will occur. Okay, C the CSF forms from the blood plasma and enters the ventricles. Okay, it is continuously formed and reabsorbed. It it's formed in the plexuses and of the ventricles and flows down, eventually, uh, into the uh, cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle, etc. All right, so here's the picture of where it comes from. Okay, so. Starts in the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle, or of the ventricle itself. In this case, we're showing the third ventricle. Okay, you would assume that the, the lateral ventricle choroid plexuses also produce cerebral spinal fluid and it flows into the third ventricle. From the third ventricle, it flows down through the cerebral aqueduct, okay, to the fourth ventricle, and then there's a lateral aperture, the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle, into past, uh, past the, between the brainstem and out of the median aperture. So the lateral aperture and the median aperture allow for cerebral spinal fluid to leak out into the subarachnoid space, which then extends completely around the brain itself. Okay, eventually excess CSF, right number five up here. You see this flow, these little bumps. See, these little guys right here, those are arachnoid villi, all right? Excess CSF flows through the arachnoid, subarachnoid space, through those arachnoid villi, and part of the fluid then empty, empties into the venous flu blood flow. Venous blood is going to go away from the brain, back towards the heart, <coughs> okay? And taking with it um, waste and... Um, metabolites, all right, the stuff that the brain cells want to get rid of, all right, excessive CSF. This also flows down across <clears throat> and through the central canal and surrounds the spinal cord, okay? So when have you heard, in what situations have you heard of an epidural before? Childbirth, okay? So where is an epidural placed? In the spine, right? Is it on the outside? Is it superficial to the dura mater? Un underneath the dura mater? Superficial to the arachnoid matter? Or deep to the arachnoid matter? To what? To the dura, right? It's on the outside. If I was to have a spinal tap, okay? For meningitis, to diagnose meningitis, you have to collect a, a, a sample of cerebral spinal fluid. Are they going to drill into your head to get that? No. Where do they get it from? Your spine, uh, through a spinal tap, okay? A spinal tap involves sending a needle through your ver the intervertebral space between the disc into the spinal cord, okay? And collecting cerebral spinal fluid 
from the subarachnoid space. All right? It's really fun. I said no one ever. It's even more fun when your three-month-old daughter has to do it. Yeah, that's not fun. But that is a common thing that happens when, a three, when an infant, a very young infant, has, has a fever, spikes a fever, uh, rapid onset fever. That is the first thing that they'll do, okay? Because that's the first thing they need to rule out is, is viral or bacterial meningitis for an infant because it can really be problematic, especially because infants have a problem regulating their body temperature. Yes. It's a little different. The epidural will block all of the feeling beneath that where the epidural is, okay? A nerve block is a little outside of that and will, will remove some of the feeling. You will still feel some of it. Because it's, oh, so you're only, you're blocking um, sensory information one way, right? So all of the sensory information is coming from beneath where the epidural is, right? That, that you can't feel. Motor information can still be generated and, and moved, but the sensory information is shut off. So it's, it's, and so it only gets from that point down because the information is only one way, okay? Here's the uh, arachnoid villi, all right? Here's the villus. There's a little overlap. CSF flows through this. Excessive stuff pushes this over, this kind of valve, and excess fluid flows into the venous blood and is returned to the circulation. Questions on flow of cerebral spinal fluid? Awesome. All right. Next important part of the brain is that it is specialized, okay? It is a preferred VIP section, and certain things go there and certain things do not, okay? And what protects that VIP area is what we call the blood-brain barrier, all right? Certain things that are found in the blood can get into the neurons, they're protected though, and other things cannot, okay? So the blood-brain barrier, blood-brain barrier, regulates what substances can actually get to the neurons and what substance cannot. Some th the point of this, it helps prevent neuron exposure to harmful substances, okay? It's good and bad, okay? It's great because it helps protect neurons, all right? Drugs, waste, abnormal solute concentrations are prevented from crossing that. Okay, so that when I get a general anesthetic um, shot, it's gonna you know, take away sensory information, but I'm not going to lose consciousness, or I'll actually be able to see what's going on, be coherent, see what's going on, because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, okay? Some drugs can pass and affect the brain, okay? THC. Ethanol, ethanol is small enough to cross the blood-brain barrier, right? Other things like acetaminophen, okay? Uh, ibuprofen, they don't cross the blood-brain barrier, okay? The barrier is made up of specialized capillaries, the blood part, and astrocytes, okay? Astrocytes extend out and they form these what's called perivascular feet and they provide the, the selective permeability of the barrier, okay? And it's reduced in certain locations for functional regions. Obviously, the choroid plexus needs more blood to produce cerebral spinal fluid, <clears throat> and the hypothalamus and the pineal gland, they need to access the blood vessels in order to release hormones, all right? So really, it's a separation between blood and brain where certain things can't cross, right? Because neurons are sensitive and protected, all right? And this is what it looks like. So you have astrocytes that wrap around these, these specialized vessels, <coughs> blood vessels. <coughs> these blood vessels are leaky, 
means that some they kind of allow for diffusion of materials, but these vascular feet uh, keep small, keep certain things out. Okay, so things can't move in. Glucose can pass, some lipids, but a lot of other things, blood vessels, blood cells, et cetera, don't pass through. Okay, questions on general aspects of the brain. We're gonna go through the different parts of it now, a little bit more, especially the cerebrum, we're gonna talk about a little bit more um, detail, more specifics, okay? The cerebrum is the origin of all complex thought and intellectual functions. The fact that you know your name and you know where you are, you can move your fingers, understand what I'm saying, um, speak in a certain language or multiple languages, uh, know red from yellow, from green, from white, understand the alphabet, that is all cerebellar uh, functions, functions of the cerebrum, okay? You have two large hemispheres on the superior aspect, all right? It is the center of intelligence and, you know, somewhat reasoning, you know, unreasonable, all right? Thought, memory, judgment, voluntary motor and visual and auditory activities, all right? So it is the biggest part because it does the most stuff, okay? It's broken up into lobes that are named for the bones that, that, that overlay them, right? So the cerebrum has a frontal lobe, parietal lobe, and occipital lobe. The separation between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe is this boundary. Actually, let's do it in green so you can see it. Is this boundary right here, what we call the central sulcus, okay? The gyrus, right? before or anterior to the central sulcus and the gyrus right posterior to the central sulcus are very important, okay? You have the pre-central gyrus and the post-central gyrus, okay? They are where most of all of your somatomotor and your somatosensory information comes from, okay? Down the middle, there's a longitudinal fissure that's anterior to posterior, separates left hemisphere from right hemisphere. Okay, here's another picture of the lobes. So frontal lobe, central sulcus, parietal lobe, occipital lobe is back there in the light blue. And this right here, this sideways is the temporal lobe. If I was to take the temporal lobe back, you have a deeper lobe, it's called the insula. All right, the insula, it is deep to the temporal lobe. Okay, question on general lobes of the, of the cerebrum. Central gyrus, right here, this pre-central gyrus outlined right there, this is motor activity, okay? The post-central gyrus is mainly sensory, okay? And left side controls right side, right side controls left side, okay? So if I were to come across a patient who is having a stroke, okay? And that patient lost, was paralyzed on his right side, what specific part of the brain would you expect the stroke to be happening on? Left what? Hemisphere. Left hemisphere, but left where? Um, left. The motor was pre-central gyrus, pre -central right? Left, left pre-central gyrus. This is what our lovely cadaver brain looks like. And here you can actually see the cerebral veins that are covered by the arachnoid matter. You can see the kind of uh, shininess that you see on, uh, on the gyrus, like right there, right? That shininess that's on the gyrus on that side, that is your deepest layer of the meninges. That is the pia matter, right? And you see the shininess here. That is the arachnoid matter with the blood vessels underneath it. You can see some arteries and veins. And you can see the longitudinal fissure, 
Hard to make out, I would say the central sulcus would be this one right there. And it goes like that. Okay? So if I go back here and I look at this pre okay? And you can see the same thing here, right? Temporal lobe. Uh, something like this. Okay? So this would be frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal. And this is the cerebellum. Okay? Questions on the brain pieces? All right? Motor areas, okay? Or the, also called the somatic motor area, okay? Most of the time, the left, the opposite side of your brain controls the motor impulses on that, on the opposite side. So the left hemisphere controls motor impulses on the right side of the body, okay? And the right hemisphere controls motor impulses on the left side of the body, okay? So this is kind of, this is gonna show you a little picture, a distorted picture of what it looks like and, and where different parts of the brain, of that portion of the brain cover, uh, control different areas, all right? You kinda, it's, it's gonna look kinda weird. Okay, so the primary motor cortex, though, is this precentral gyrus. So this little picture is what we call a homunculus. It's this kind of distorted picture view of showing you where on the precentral gyrus, from left to right, right from let's say middle near the hemis near the longitudinal hem fissure to lateral where these motor impulses are, okay? So toes, ankle, knee, hip, trunk, all of this kind of goes all the way out to the pharynx. So if this person who is having a stroke, notice paralysis of the face, but nothing else, where would you consider the stroke to be? Somewhere in this area, right? So you can kind of think about where it's going to be. But now, a lot of times what happens? A stroke affects a whole half side of the brain. It depends on where the bleed is and, and et cetera, okay? But that's, you can kind of start to think about where these things are happening, okay? <clears throat> Other motor, uh, motor areas. Motor speech areas, we call the Broca's area. It's located in the inferior lateral portion of the left frontal lobe. What does inferior lateral mean? Bottom, Bottom side, right? So it's frontal lobe, but it's inferior to, so it's lower, but and it's off to the side. That's in most people, right? It controls the movements for vocalization. And that's, that's actually where you can learn languages, your speech area, where things can go from there, right? Your frontal eye field regulates some eye movements for reading and binocular vision. And then your premotor cortex, okay? <clears throat> Somatic motor association area. So learn skills activities such as riding a bike, uh, forming sentences, uh, also associates, okay? So sensory ear, so precentral gyrus is your primary motor area, okay? The postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe is your primary sensory area, okay? And it receives somatic information from the body, such as pressure reception, touch, pressure, pain, temperature, you name it, okay? And they also map this as a sensory homunculus, right? The distorted proportions reflect the amount of sensory information collected, right? <clears throat> large regions, large sensory information for lips, fingers, genital regions, okay? So 
This, and then you have your som somatosensory association area, which is just after the postcentral gyrus and it integrates touch information, allowing us to identify objects by feel. Okay, so here's the homunculus, right? Genitals, legs, foot, fingers, right? So think about what we do in our, how much sensory information comes from our hands, right? And then our eyes and so on. The homunculus distorted how much information is there. So here's a nice little map of the brain, shows you kind of sensory information, what happens, where things are. <clears throat> I like this little picture. Um, helps kind of map things out. Questions on the orders, the functions, or the specific areas that we're talking about. Cut this in, in half, right? You could actually see some other uh, important pieces. One important one is the corpus callosum. It is a myelinated axon, white matter, that allows talk between integrate or communication between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain. So neurons can integrate from left and right sides. Uh, here's another picture of this homunculus. Okay. And you can actually, I like this side to side because you can see sort of how these are mapped where hands for motor are very close to hands for sensory. Imagine that this is, this is left and this is right, but think that there's another, these are on both sides are, are sandwiched one on top of one another. Okay, <clears throat> so the motor, the sensory map, right? Sensory information for the face is very close for the motor information for the face. So they can kind of talk to one another very quickly. Other sensory areas, all right? Your primary visual cortex is in the occipital lobe. That's why if you hit the back of your head, sometimes you see stars, all right? Because that's where all that visual information is going to. The visual association area integrates color, form, memory, right? That's in your primary visual cortex that surrounds it. Your auditory cortex, right, for sensory information for listening is in the temporal lobes. Think about where your ears are, where the temporal lobe is. And then so auditory association area is within the temporal lobe, and it's going to associate what sounds are. So not only can you hear the sound, but now you're going to interpret them and retrieve memories of what it is. So you hear that song on the radio that you haven't heard in a while, and then that associates a memory with it, or you start to listen and you know the words, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, other sensory areas, primary olfactory and gustatory cortex, olfaction is sm the smell. <clears throat> That's in also associated with the temporal lobe. It is also the most uh, associated sense to memory. Okay, and gustatory complex located within the insula. That's taste information. Other functional brain regions, you have a prefrontal cortex, Wernick's area, <clears throat> right? The prefrontal cortex, thought, judgment, personality, planning, deciding, it is still developing in adolescence. That's why teenagers make crappy decisions. I'm just kidding. Or am I? I don't know, right? Still developing in adolescence. That's also why we tell, you know, scientists and medical professionals say, you know, don't do drugs, this is your brain on drugs, et cetera. Don't do things that can affect neurons as they're developing. Wernick's area, right, language comprehension, so understanding that I'm, t I'm speaking English versus Spanish versus Italian, German, whatever. All right, and you know what that means. And the Gnostic area is a common integrative area, integrates information from all of these different senses together. Okay, becomes aware of your situation lunchtime, okay? Now, some clinical disorders that are associated with higher order function, okay? 
Biggest one is autism. It's becoming more and more prevalent every year, right? I would say um, incidence <coughs> has risen in the last 25 years. It's, I, it says less than one in 88, but I actually think it's, it's um, lower than that now. Um, probably one in 80 or so. All right, less than one in 100 altogether. <laughs> and part of the reason the incidence has gone up is because we're more aware of it. It's being diagnosed better, um, and we kind of associate it with, with what it is. All right, it's characterized by social and communication difficulties. Severity varies across the aut autism spectrum. So it's, it's a spectrum of disorders, ranging from relatively mild and kind of quirky to uh, almost nonverbal um, shelter. Okay? Um, the best predictors of independent adulthood are intelligence and communication ability. So, some people who have autism beyond the autism spectrum can function pretty well, others cannot. Specific cases or causes are unknown. Um, there is a genetic link, there's environmental factors that are, are and bio, biochemical factors that are also associated with this. There's some thoughts to nutrition being able to, uh, nutrition of the mom or, and or dad during, um, mom during pregnancy, dad prior to pregnancy, prior to fertilization. Uh, males have a four times higher incidence than females. And just so everyone's clear, vaccines are not the reason, okay? So we are all scientists in here today. You all can say if vaccines do not cause autism, okay? Factual, straight up fact. There's no, there's really no debate. Vaccines do not cause autism, okay? So here's some lobes in there. And you guys can go through the lobes in the frontal area their specific areas, you will not need to identify them on an exam and be like, hey, that's this area, that's that area. You should have some idea. If I asked you what Broca's area is, it's speech. Wernick's area, understanding language, et cetera, et cetera. The ones that we talked about, you are responsible for, okay? And then motor and association areas, those pictures you guys can go over on your own, okay? <coughs> Question. I went really fast today. <laughs>